Yeah, and I, uh, I was sad to hear about at Deet Singh's passing, he was a great economist. Uh, Mike knew him, my friend Mike here, a lot better than I did, but I saw him all over the world, actually, even when he was, uh, you know, you wouldn't think he could travel anywhere. He was, he was quite a, a person. Okay, uh, what I'm going to try to do uh, is, uh, there's a, a lot of material I'm going to cover, and I'm going to go over it somewhere quite quickly, because there is a theoretical framework uh, that uh, I'm going to present uh, very quickly. Uh, uh, there is a, a, a methodology which I call integrating theory and history, so that, that you have to kind of use theory to understand the changing world. And basically what we want to do in, do, uh, in, in this integration of theory and history is something that I started calling catching up with history. That we actually, uh, I'm an economist, I was never trained in a story, and I was at one point president of the Business History Conference in the United States, which is a conference of business historians. But I got into looking at history simply because we live in a world of change. And if we don't understand how things are changing, then we don't understand the world. And uh, catching up with history is trying to sort of go back in time, uh, not to, you know, zero AD or whatever, but uh, uh, go back in time to uh, see how things are evolving so that when uh, the world starts to change, and, and we see it happening all around us, we're not just sitting there dumbfounded, and we can at least uh, enter into the debate fairly quickly, learn what we need to learn in order to have something significant to say. Now, the, it starts with the economic development challenge, and probably most economists uh, would agree that you want to get stable and equitable growth. Uh, and then the question is, how do you achieve, achieve this? I, I started calling this sustainable prosperity at some point. Uh, we don't seem to have it now. Uh, we had a period after World War II where uh, uh, we, there was a promise of sustainable prosperity. Uh, some people call it the golden era. Uh, uh, and by the 1960s, which is when I started studying economics, uh, there were mo a lot of economists who uh, actually were much better in general than the economists who are in economics departments now, I should say, uh, who uh, thought that uh, the advanced countries offered some lessons to the less developed countries, and development economics uh, was, was a big field. It's something that I studied at that time as an undergraduate and as a grad student here at London School of Economics. But it, then it faded in the 1970s with the stagflation of the 1970s, uh, and people were saying, well, what are we trying to emulate? What, what, what is going on in these advanced economies? And I uh, came to the conclusion that uh, economists, even the good ones, didn't really have that much of a right to talk about economic development because they didn't understand how the advanced economies had become rich, uh, and uh, that this was uh, the task. And it wasn't just because we wanted to understand how advanced economies became rich, we wanted to understand the whole problem of economic development. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, then, people were surprised what they call the East Asian miracle. And I started doing a lot of work on Japan, and I'd go to Japan and talk to people, particularly who were doing uh, the history of uh, business in Japan. And they would say to me, we don't like this term miracle because it's something you can't explain. And I agree with them entirely. Uh, the very use of the term is, is saying, you know, it, 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 it's something you don't know what you're talking about. And economists, as we know, uh, if you follow that debate, coming out of the World Bank, didn't really know what they were talking about. And then meanwhile, by the 19, uh, by the, the turn of the century, China uh, appears on the, on the scene. And uh, as people have talked about China and its you know, three decades of, of very high speed growth, somehow they forget that this is a communist country that they're calling the most dynamic capitalist country in the world. Uh, they also forget the fact that uh, it seems that the so former Soviet Union was supposed to be a superpower. And we, kind of grew up seeing the United States and the Soviet Union and you know, competing at least politically and also potentially economically in, in the world, is, is, is a paper tiger. I mean, there are no major companies that have come out of the so former Soviet Union other than commodities companies in the world today. You can go look at the Global 1000, you won't find any. And China has some. And, and so there's, there's a big difference here uh, in uh, the, nat the dynamic of development. And then when we come to the current decade, as it's unfolding, we see that the advanced economies aren't doing too well. They really don't know uh, where they're going. And uh, even though, as a point I make in the United States, the United States is twice as rich now on a uh, real GDP per capita basis than it was 40 years ago, P 
people don't feel that way, that's for, for sure. The, the uh, increase in income inequality, the loss of uh, uh, what we call middle class jobs, it just goes on and on, and it needs explanation. Now, here's the bad news from uh, well-trained economists, although they didn't really they pay that much attention uh, to this book. But it, it, the problem is, if you're really well-trained as an economist and really believe what, you've been, what you learn, uh, you won't understand the modern economy, any modern economy. Uh, because uh, modern economies are social uh, phenomena based on organization. And markets are the outcome of successful capitalist development. And that's really one of the main messages. And there's three types of uh, or social organizations, of organizations that invest in the economy, the government agencies, household families, which make huge long-term investments in the face of uncertainty, and business enterprises. And if you have government agencies putting in all of this infrastructure, all the uh, knowledge base in, in, in place, and uh, you don't ultimately get products that people want at prices they can afford or need at prices uh, that, they, that they have the money to spend on them, then you're not going to get higher standards of living. Um, I think the uh, ability of families then to invest in the labor force is part of a dynamic, but you know, that's really driven m very much by the ability to basically get the government to help subsidize that process. So every government in the world and every country in the world where you have uh, a decent development has had huge investments in education, often way ahead of, of demand, uh, to the point you have brain drains and then they get reversed, and uh, in some cases, in some cases not. Uh, but also, families need to have good incomes coming from some employment, and most of that employment comes from the business sector. And one of the things that I focused on quite early on was uh, the importance of understanding business to this process. And so, this goes against even a lot of people in political economy who talk about states and markets and somehow forget that there are business enterprises that really dominate the economy, and often there's the size of whole countries. I mean, some, some of the business enterprises that really, mm -hmm. at some point, either generate a lot of innovation, or at some points, if they don't start keep investing, uh, we get into real trouble. And that's where I get into some of the recent work I've been doing on the failure of American companies, the most uh, dominant companies often got to their positions by being a very highly innovative in the past to uh, continue to make investments in innovation. Uh, this is about economics. So economics is about resource allocation, uh, but it's one where it says who actually makes those decisions uh, about re allocating resources is very important. So there's uh, people who are making strategic decisions, and we have to know who they are. It matters. It's not just people allocating uh, uh, capital to the most profitable uses. They have to actually create those profitable uses. To do that, we have to know what kind of uh, investments they make, and they have to understand what kind of investments they make. It's, not, it's often that the most important investments are in human capital, and how the returns from those the investments are distributed. So this is all about economics. It's not about something else. The theory of the market economy, which is neoclassical economic theory, uh, basically assumes the question, all these questions away because it, it really doesn't matter. Uh, uh, the notion is, you, you run a company to make a profit, uh, you, there are capabilities out there, you employ those capabilities, you pay the market price. In the end, all firms are the same, basically, because nobody does anything to make them different. That's not the economy we know. So we have to think about organizations, not m markets. And so every time I hear the term market imperfection, often by people who ha have the same problem with the lack of sustainable prosperity in the economy, I kind of cringe a bit and say, are you saying that there's something out there called perfect markets that's a benchmark even if it's impossible? No, that's wrong. You've got to understand organization. Or when I hear people talk about market failures as if the market could achieve some equitable distribution of income, no, it doesn't do that. Uh, it's organizations actually, when they work well, that I would say are the foundation of having equitable and stable growth. So this is what uh, we need to understand. And by the way, uh, you know, I come from a very critical tradition in, in economics, uh, but I think uh, in this, uh, again, my friend Mike here, uh, something we have in common, we'd be seen as, as pro-business, you know, which is actually, I think, very important because you have to understand being pro-business that if you don't have business operating properly in the economy, you've got a big problem. Okay, now here are uh, all the people you uh, kind of uh, know. Uh, I didn't, these are all too old for uh, 
for me to have met any of them, or although I'm going to tell you two people, show you two people coming up who I, who, who, uh, who I did know, uh, who are not with us anymore. But you know, there are different ideas out there uh, about what drives the capitalist economy, and it's very important to kind of consider these ideas. But in the end, after having actually taught history of economic thought in many cases a uh, long time ago, I taught it at, at Harvard University to PhD students that hadn't been taught there for 10 years, you can believe it or not, even in the 1970s. Uh, I came to this conclusion that uh, the people who were talking about the growth of the firm uh, were probably the most, econ most uh, uh, social, important social scientists of, of the 20th century from the point of view of what I was doing. And there's one person here, Edith Penrose, who we had a conference at uh, SOAS uh, uh, last, uh, last November. It was, uh, I think, a very successful conference. Uh, uh, she had wrote this path-breaking book, The Theory of the Growth of the Firm. And as I say here, she actually didn't see it as cent necessarily central to the whole corpus of economics, but she should have. Because I think if you don't understand how firms grow, you don't understand the, 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 the modern economy, capitalist, communist, whatever you're talking about. And this guy, Alfred Chandler, who I got to know very well in the 1980s, I was never a student of his, but I found him at Harvard Business School and I was around there for a long time. I learned a whole lot about him because particularly American capitalism, American business, you could sit down with him, he, he knew what he was talking about. Uh, uh, and he inspired a whole bunch of people to do really serious research that's out there that I've uh, drawn on and synthesized in many cases. Now in doing this, I came to it as an economist uh, saying, okay, we need theory, but we need theory both as a summary of what we think we know now and as a guide what we need to know. Uh, this is very different than what uh, I was taught as, as an economist, uh, even starting in the 1960s, because what dominated then, dominates now, is Milton Friedman's no notion of positive economics. It doesn't matter what your assumptions are, as long as your predictions are correct. The problem is, most of the time, economists' predictions aren't correct, and then they don't know why they're not correct, because they don't know where the assumptions came from. They came from the fact that some other economists had made some assumptions, and they just are following on. So they have no methodology for understanding the economy, and it's not surprising that they don't. So uh, that's the main thing. We want to understand the economy. Uh, we need to understand the innovation process because getting higher quality products that then you get a large market share, that's what drives productivity growth in the economy. That's what allows people to get higher incomes being part of that process. That's what drives a robust middle class. And if you don't have what I call innovative enterprise, you don't have a successful economy. Now, the certain characteristics of innovation, uncertain, it, it uh, can't be done optimally. So anytime economists say the optimal this and optimal that, even people even talk about optimal innovation, that's just, well, that's an oxymoron. I mean, you, you don't know when you go into something what the outcome is going to be. You just have to do it. When you actually are successful in innovation, it generally is a collective process. It requires a division of labor and people working together uh, to achieve a certain end. And it takes time. Uh, so these, uh, it, 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 in what you learned yesterday, uh, allows you to uh, determine what, what you can learn today. When it's successful, you actually can potentially make everybody better off. And I won't go through this, but uh, you, you can have a lot of stakeholders in the economy, a lot of participants in the economy, uh, sharing in the gains of innovation. That doesn't necessarily happen, but it can happen. Okay, now here is the way I talk about this. And this should be in every introductory economics textbook, but of course it's not. Uh, because I've been talking about this for I don't know how long. Uh, but basically, you start with the economist's notion that uh, the fir there's a limit to growth by the firm buying inputs on the market, and even though it's spreading out at fixed costs, it, 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 the, the, the cost curve become U -shape, becomes U-shaped. Well, economists love this because it gives them equilibrium, and there's a defined size of the firm and a lot of other things follow from it that I won't get into here. But what's on the left hand side, or I guess your right hand side, is, uh, um, is uh, disrupting that. It's a firm that comes along and says we're not going to do things the same way everybody's doing. And basically here is the way we can understand how innovation uh, over outcompetes optimization. And uh, obviously, in this context, optimization becomes an ideologically loaded world. So somebody has this idea that they're going to make an investment, and uh, they're going to outcompete the optimizing firm. Now, uh, it tends to be at low levels of output, high fixed costs for two reasons. You have to integrate more activities. 
and it takes time. Fixed costs are also a function of time. So if it, if, if it takes from here, you know, two years, three years, four years, you're building up the fixed cost of, of this investment strategy. Okay, and so you make this investment, but you, the reason I have a dotted line is there, you, don't, you can't say, nobody can say whether it's going to be successful. Okay, so uh, after a period of time, let's call it a year or whatever, uh, you see that in fact uh, your costs ca start increasing and there's a limit to your growth. And uh, let's say there's an entrepreneur who really believes in this process and a, and a financier, a venture capitalist you know, who, who is, is funding this thing, and the venture capitalist said, hey, I thought you were going to outcompete the existing firms, and you're not doing that, what's going on here? And you say, well, yeah, we got a problem because as we try to integrate and not invest in certain things and just buy them on the market, our costs started rising. I would say that insofar as that happens, it's usually not labor, but it's, it has to do with materials, particular materials that are in short supply. So that's the bad news, but the good news is that we learned something in doing this, that we have to invest in that input and uh, unbound and un, un, uh, that U-shaped cost curve. And the, 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 the good news is that we know we have to do it. The bad news is we've got to put more money into it. And basically, uh, so you start at being at a competitive disadvantage after one period, but then you continue to make these in investments. It may never be successful. Uh, you may have to go through 100 iterations of this process and before it's successful. It uh, may, as in a, many pharmaceutical drugs, take 20 years uh, before, it, before it's successful. But there's a learning process going on here. Okay, and that's basically innovation. I think this would have been what Schumpeter had in mind in talking about innovation. Now, there's uh, three things that are going on here. Uh, strategy, organization, finance. Someone has to make a decision to, to confront that uncertainty. And it's not going to be just anybody. It's going to be someone who knows the industry and who believes that they can produce a product that doesn't exist. You're going to have to put together an organization, and that organization is one of the things I learned from Chandler. That's part of the high fixed cost, is keeping that organization intact, keeping the people employed, keeping not just the plant and equipment, which is what economists usually look at. There's an organization of people. And you're going to have to sustain that process with finance that at the beginning is fungible. You can put it here or there, but has to be tied up until uh, you success. So what, what many people call patient capital. So I get from, from this framework of the innovative enterprise three social conditions of innovative enterprise. Uh, strategic control, it matters who is making these decisions, their incentives and abilities in the face of uncertainty. Organizational integration, you have to integrate and mobilize the skills and efforts of, of, of uh, people in a hierarchical functional division of labor, create incentives for them to be involved in this process. And financial commitment uh, in a context where finance, money, uh, is, uh, is, is liquid, you have to get it committed to, to, to this process. And so that's when I look at the at, uh, uh, innovation process in particular contexts, particular times, places, uh, even in terms of national economies, as, as I'll, I'll sort of mention briefly in a minute, uh, I look for these social conditions of innovative enterprise. Now I have, I'll, I can send these slides around, I have a lot of questions here that we ask uh, in looking at these uh, these these social uh, conditions about you know, who makes investments and uh, what kind of people you're investing in, et cetera, what sources of finance. Industries matter a whole lot. Uh, investing uh, in a, you know, a software application for, let's say, an Apple computer uh, or, or a device is very different than a, a biopharmaceutical drug uh, or investing in the steel industry. I mean, there are different technological conditions, different uh, dynamics of technological change, different market conditions. Sometimes it's a government that is your main source of fun, um, uh, market, uh, which I'll come to in a minute. And there are different competitive conditions of who, who you're competing against, and those have to be taken into account. So we look at that whenever we look at particular industries in different, different times and places. Okay, so this kind of summarizes this, but we do have to bring in the demand side, and this is the way I have looked at it. Um, basically, in advanced countries, and I would say the United States is foremost among them, uh, mainly because the state is always there investing for decades in new technology before they actually, businesses pick them up and get commercialized in high tech fields at least. And also, I mean, the, the investment of the United States uh, in education uh, goes back to the 19th century, higher education, public education, there's a whole lot of examples of this. Uh, 
And, but the state also stands there, uh, in many cases, usually through the military, uh, as a source of uh, demand. When you're at an early stage in development of a technology, and you need a high income price insensitive market. Uh, I, if I had time, I could go through other examples that don't involve the state. Uh, uh, calculators is a, is a good one. But uh, at some point, how those technologies get developed, and com some companies take them to a middle income price matters market. Uh, and at a later point, they become commodities. Uh, and actually, the innovative companies get out of them, and they might end up going to a low-wage country, country which starts investing in that particular uh, product. Now, uh, a lot of the East Asian development, including Japan, even though people, started with Chalmers Johnson particularly, his book, uh, Miti and the Japanese Miracle, uh, uh, talked about the developmental state in Japan. The United States was Japan's developmental state. But Japan and other countries like Germany, Japan in the late 19th century learned to transfer technologies. And it was actually companies that sent people abroad, often for years, and they all came back. There was never a brain drain, came back and, and developed and brought the, a lot of those technologies back to J Japan. And uh, um, Japan then started really at the, at the low end, bringing the technologies back for an income-constrained country uh, actually, when they tried to do this with the military, of course, in the 20s and 30s, they ran into disaster. But after World War II, you can think of this in terms of cars and, and consumer electronics. Uh, they were producing for a very income-constrained country. They uh, were, had a reputation for low quality. And what we, that was kind of ironic. You know, the, the story that, uh, which you still heard in the 1970s, they said there was some place in uh, Japan that named itself USA so it could say made in USA. So, uh, you know, in the 60s, uh, I mean, you know, you, you, Japanese goods were shoddy goods. By the late 70s, early 80s, and cars and other things, they're, they're high quality goods. That didn't just happen overnight. It's actually the research that many people have done, including some that I've been involved in, looked at that process of, uh, of building up this uh, the, 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 the ability to qu do quality production including exporting the management methods, which they did in the, in the you know, uh, Kaizen, just-in-time inventory systems, et cetera, in the, in the 1980s. Uh, and it had a long history, but it was constrained by, by the incomes of the Japanese, which were, uh, you know, in the 60s, and uh, still about a fifth in the per capita uh, basis of, of, of the U.S. Once they got the foreign markets, they started moving up and got into these middle-income uh, price matters markets. and. Uh, with their small cars, and then quickly saw that people would pay a little extra for quality. Uh, they didn't want their cars rusting out. They wanted uh, the cars to last longer, et, et cetera. They, they, and by 1989, uh, Nissan and Toyota came up with cars that uh, caused the Germans a lot of problem with the Infiniti and, and, uh, and, and Lexus. And, uh, and they, they could move up in terms of quality. So that's kind of the example. And this is happening all the time in countries where you don't have actually a very strong uh, developmental state. I think Korea actually, South Korea has a stronger in terms of technology developmental state than Japan ever had. And Japan, China is developing it, it's so, the, so uh, uh, such a diverse country. But there's different paths to development, but they, they often are starting going in this direction, at least that's what's happened in East Asia. Now, uh, this is something we talked about this afternoon. This picture that I showed you about uh, innovating firms, out-competing, out optimizing firms, that can be used to explain uh, the conditions why you need uh, to support in infant industries. Uh, why at a, at a low level of income when uh, output, uh, when you're just trying to develop an industry, you have to subsidize industry or create tariff barriers uh, so that the other goods countries that are already developed there, uh, their, their, those products that don't just flood your market. And then the question is, what do you get out of that? And uh, you can't just say, well, it's going to work. Uh, you have to have a theory of innovative enterprise to see how I innovation actually occurs. Uh, and uh, in the early uh, 90s, uh, really talking about Japanese development, we started using the term uh, indigenous innovation. I'm not sure where I got the term from, but this seems like an, uh, like an important uh, phenomenon in Japan that borrowing or transferring really technology from abroad, improving, uh, improving it, coming up ultimately with better products, which even happened in the early uh, 20th century in things like engines for ships, etc. Uh, that this was an important phenomenon. And we started studying this 
in the case of China, and there was a fellow named Chi Van Lu who unfortunately uh, died just before this book came out, but this is really a pioneering book. Never got, for some reason, translated into Chinese, uh, but it was about indigenous innovation in, in, in China. Uh, and uh, actually, in 2006, the Chinese government adopted the policy, official policy, through the Ministry of, of Science and Technology of Indigenous Innovation. And there, uh, I won't go into it, but there is a, actually a line from his work to adopting that policy. So uh, uh, academic work can have some influence. Uh, the developmental state, again, I think it's uh, the notion of, of Eastern, uh, <coughs> East Asian developmental states has been overdone in turn from a technology point of view. From a finance point of view, uh, it, it, it's very real. But from a technology point of view, it was uh, transfer uh, much more from the United States, which of course, uh, there is a notion in the United States the state is not, well, you know, that's just ignorance, total ignorance on the part of most people, anybody would argue that. Uh, there's an interaction that we have to understand between innovative enterprises and de developmental states. Uh, there's a partnership, <coughs> there's a, but ultimately, if the innovative enterprise doesn't carry through in generating the products uh, and then getting a large market share, you're not going to have high standards of living. Uh, you can't do it uh, with, with, without the innovative enterprise. Uh, there's a lot, you know, I, I, uh, uh, a lot of the history of economics, basically, and some, uh, you know, including the people I showed before, that got, has gotten left behind by neoclassical economists, of course, including the work of Marx. Uh, but uh, one of the things I learned in the 70s, when as a radical economist, said, what do Marx have to say? And my view is, what is not? Let's not start with what Marx has to say for today. Let's see what he had to say for the 19th century. Did he, did he get it right back then? Let's look at theory and history in, in, in the 19th century. And I found that, in fact, Marx got it wrong. I wouldn't have gotten to why he got it wrong if I hadn't had Marx's framework. So it was this interaction of uh, theory and history. And then when you come to the 20th century, Edith Penrose, uh, having a much more modest agenda, actually got it right. And that is that successful capitalist development, not universally, but in its leading sectors, workers share in the gains. Capitalists need the workers. They need to train the workers, uh, or they need the workers that, even in the case of 19th century Britain, train themselves. And they need to share the productivity gains in order to become world leaders. And everybody is better off. Now, uh, this uh, was a uh, 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 paper that was uh, published uh, in 1979 uh, on, uh, on uh, Marx and technology in the 19th century. <laughs> Uh, where Marx argued that technological development re reproduces the domination of capital over labor on an ever more oppressive scale. And this is basically a basic tenet of Marxian economics of you know, technology being used to dominate workers, uh, uh, forcing workers to become commodities, and just uh, getting surplus value out of that intensification of labor. Uh, and Marx, to his credit, <laughs> tried to die, say, you know, it, it, there's a lot of history in Marx. A lot of Marxists skip over the history, but if you read it, you can say, well, you know, did that actually happen? So this is one of the statements. He says it would be possible to write, write quite a history of the inventions made since 1830 for the sole purpose of supplying capital with weapons against the revolts of the working class. At the head of these, in importance, stands the self-acting mule, um, I don't know if you've heard of self-acting mules, but uh, you'll see I, I became a kind of world expert in self-acting mules because of this statement, uh, because it opened up a new ep epoch in the, the automatic system. So I started to say, well, is the, what happened with self-acting mules? Now, I can't go into all that except to show you this picture. This is a mule spinning room. It was actually a fairly complicated technology. This, these, these machines made Britain the workshop of the world in the 19th century. Uh, this guy, who was the mule spinner, they called him the minder with the self-acting mule, hired these people. There's actually three people there. Uh, one is kind of shadowy that are piecers, and this guy here is uh, cleaning underneath. It's called the doffer. Uh, and it turned out that Marx was just wrong. It, uh, uh, capital, the, this, this machine, did not uh, commoditize labor. Uh, the division of labor in which labor actually, the minder hired the other people, remained well into the 20th century. Uh, uh, this became a way in which you got high productivity out of the, the machines. And Britain, you know, Eric Hobsbawm written, you know, wrote the book Age of Empire, 
If you want to understand Britain in the 19th century, you have to understand cotton, and he was right. Now it happens right here, uh, I guess it was about 36 years ago, <laughs> I presented this research at Eric Cosbaum's seminar. It was right across here at the Institute of Historical Studies. And a few years later, uh, Eric Cosbaum had this statement in his book, because he wrote about the labor aristocracy and the fact that by the late 19th century, uh, a lot of uh, British workers uh, uh, were actually doing pretty well. And, uh, and this became a kind of a puzzle for Marxist historians and Marxians who paid attention to history. And he made this statement uh, uh, about what Lazonic said. Well, it actually wasn't quite right, because uh, if you look at it, he said that in the 1930s, these, this group of workers lost their original privileges that didn't happen. Uh, they never got rid of uh, the uh, skilled workers. They never got rid of the, the way in which they organized production. Um, and then he says uh, very long, uh, that in the long term, it was very costly to British capitalism. You didn't get modern management methods because too many skills were on the shop floor, which was actually something, I think, quite insightful for, for a Marxian historian to be, to be saying. But it, that was very long term. Uh, in the late 19th century, there were huge productivity benefits of having the workers organize production and sharing the gains with them. Uh, this was true also uh, and shifted much more the, the advantage to the United States when you had the managerial revolution in American business. Uh, and go back to Chandler's book, The Visible Hand. If you haven't read it, you should read it. Uh, the managerial revolution in American business, that ended around 1920. Uh, the capitalists basically were not there. And the capitalists who were still there trying to run the show like Henry Ford, they often uh, almost drove their, their companies into the ground. It was professional managers who were running uh, American companies, reinvesting in, in their companies, and uh, uh, helping with the growth of uh, the American economy, or really driving the growth of the American economy. So by the 1950s, uh, uh, you have people talking about this, including Edith Penrose and these kind of books, uh, uh, which uh, this popular book, he became an urban sociologist, William H. White, and a well-known sociologist, uh, 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 C. Wright Mills, about this middle class in the United States. And this was the foundation of, uh, of American prosperity, the large corporations sharing the gains with these organization men, and they were largely men. Uh, they were also not just white collar, they were white male. Uh, that is, it was, it was a particular group of people uh, that, that shared in the gains, but it was what drove the United States to be the world's largest economy. Now, I have a more general framework in which I talk about this in terms of institutions and the social conditions of innovative enterprise, and all I'll say about that is that, uh, that we can look in particular national economies at what we call, might call governance institutions, way in which you have the rights and responsibilities of running companies, and map that on issues to do with strategic control. Uh, we can look at uh, what I call employment institutions, uh, ways in which people are hired, uh, rules about hiring and firing, uh, uh, and we can map that on issues uh, uh, of organizational integration. And we can look at investment institutions, uh, how finance is allocated in the economy and the rules about that, and what you can do and cannot do with finance, and map that on issues of financial commitment. So there's a framework in which we can uh, look across countries uh, over time, and uh, I haven't done all this research myself, but you, you can actually integrate a lot of research in different times, different places on what actually is going on in economies and rise and fall of industrial leadership and ultimately issues of economic development from this framework. I mean, I can't convince you of that here. I can just say that I, I found it very useful. Now, in all this, you've got to uh, actually look at large firms, uh, at least uh, if once you see the economy that have become successful. And I don't care where it is. And even, even in a place, uh, a kind of exception is a third Italy, where you have lots of small firms. But ultimately, uh, those faults, there's, a, there's a coordinating mechanism for those, those districts. And there's certain industries where small firms can survive, and also when there's certain ideology, but even then, there's a lot of large firms that are like Fiat and, and, and some of the big oil companies, etc., that you find in, in a country like Italy. But it's not that you only look at, 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 at large firms, but if you miss them and you don't understand how they became large, you have a problem. Uh, now, uh, these are data, they no longer put these out, but you can see here, if you just take even 5,000 or more, I mean 500 or more is, uh, 
employees is already a large firm, uh, and that's 50% of business employment in the United States, 56% uh, of payrolls, and 62% of revenues. Uh, lots of smaller firms are going to depend on what those investment uh, allocation resources by those larger firms. Okay, now this is getting into a particular application of uh, this area where I've looked at the U.S. economy and saw it go from uh, what I call a retain and reinvest regime where you were building up the economy, large firms uh, grew large by reinvesting in the economy and that was the norm uh, to uh, a regime of downsize and distribute. These are terms that I kind of came up with with work with Mario Sullivan in the 1990s. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it, it, it's, it's a very good framework for understanding the U.S. economy. And I say unfortunately because this is a uh, graph, many people have used this, uh, looking at wages and productivity. And in the post-war two decades, wages track productivity in the United States. Uh, and then there was this divergence which has gone on. And uh, this divergence is reflected in things that Thomas Piketty has talked about, of concentration of income at the top. Uh, and things that people have noticed who are worried about labor since the 1980s, the erosion of middle class jobs. Uh, and I would argue that what was going on uh, when wages were tracking productivity is workers were sharing in the gains of large corporations uh, and companies in general. If you wanted, you retained people, you retained them, and you got higher standard of living, that drove wages up in the economy. Anybody who wanted that kind of labor uh, had to compete with what the leading companies were doing for that labor, and uh, if they couldn't, they couldn't uh, stay in business. Uh, that changed uh, quite dramatically in the 1980s. And uh, here, economics played a role. Uh, at least Edith Penrose didn't, uh, her work summarized that, what was going on. Uh, but this guy actually, Michael Jensen, uh, he ha played a role in not Obviously, uh, there were lots of other things going on in terms of the way the economy had changed uh, in at least legitimizing what I call the downsize and distribute regime. Um, uh, I, this article that uh, that graph is from was published in Harvard Business Review last September. Uh, it, I can tell you that it was the first time I ever even tried to get an article in Harvard Business Review. They approached me. Uh, went through over a year and a half of working on the article, and uh, I think it, it came out very well, and it got published, and it had an impact, uh, and uh, much more impact than everything I've written over my whole career. But uh, uh, I got interviewed, this is someone I know very well, uh, Lynn Paramore, uh, did an interview uh, with me uh, where she said, you've been studying stock buybacks, which is the thing I focus on in that article, uh, for the, over the last three years, what exactly are they and why are you so interested in them? And so I responded, at least being my response, is let me start by answering the second part of your question. That's why I'm a little interested in them, because I've just been studying stock buybacks over the last 30 years. I'd be bored out of my mind. Uh, and uh, I then went to, on to talk about uh, my involvement, uh, particularly at Harvard Business School with Business History Group, Chandler, uh, really consolidating my understanding of the role of big business in driving the growth of the U.S. economy and a trend toward somewhat more equality after uh, in the post-war two decades. And then I saw, and I learned some crucial lessons about this, which I then uh, went on to enumerate. And, but basically, uh, the stock market was not important in the rise of capitalism. It never has funded uh, really, in any significant way, even back in the early uh, 20th century, the rise of big business. The, the critical constraint was managerial capability. And it was a separation of ownership control, which, of course, documented in 1932 by Burley and Means in, in, in a classic book. It's like Penrose's book is a classic book. It's a book that everybody cites, but nobody's read. But it, you know, it was documented at that time as a separation of ownership control. Burley and Means, if you know that book, they thought it was the rise of big business because one person didn't have enough money to invest in this business. That was not the reason. It was because you needed to have professional managers running these companies if they were going to surprise. And a set of institutions responded to that in the United States. In a sense, quite unexpectedly, because the people who became the dominant people in companies in the night by the 1920s uh, were white Anglo-Saxon Protestant males who had been kind of the Tocqueville, when he had gone to the United States in the, in, in the early uh, 19th century, these were the yeomen of Mary, you know, the individualists, and somehow they became the organization men. 
and they, they drove the development of the economy. Uh, uh, the other thing, uh, uh, however, just as I was really consolidating my understanding of this, and uh, 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 was that I saw uh, shareholder value ideology. I witnessed it come into at Harvard Business School. It was not there in 1984. It was there in 1986, and by 1990, it was totally dominant in the teaching of uh, MBAs and executives. Uh, the vast majority of Harvard Business School professors did not believe it. I still meet some of them now who said, how did this happen? I said, how did you let them hire Michael Jensen? Why did you let this kind of ideology become dominant in Harvard Business School? Maybe they couldn't have controlled it because of the broader financialization of the economy, uh, but it happened. Uh, the manifestation of this is what you might call the buyback binge. And for the past decade, uh, it's minus net equity issues in the United States are minus of almost $400 billion. So this is from uh, Federal Reserve flow of funds data. So about $4 trillion net has flown out of companies to fund uh, the stock market and ultimately fund a lot of gambling in the financial sector. And these are basically people going to work every day producing value and the money is coming out and going to people who generally have had nothing to do with building up those companies and uh, using it uh, to enrich themselves and to actually go after more money. Uh, so I go through uh, this uh, change. This is actually the same set, same companies uh, going back to 1981, and I could trace through uh, the growth of buybacks from being insignificant in the early 1980s uh, to become surpassing dividends as a force, form of distribution to shareholders in 1997. Much more volatile, uh, but dividends have not gone down. Both have gone up, and the result is that for many large companies. Uh, in a variety of industries, so these are the, for the decade 2004-2013, uh, the lar 25 largest repurchasers in the United States. Uh, for most of them, it's more than 100% of their profits uh, are going into distribution to shareholders. Uh, they're selling off assets, they're now borrowing money to do this, they're firing workers to do it. There's a lot of ways you can get over 100% and well over 100%. This has become systemic. Okay, so, uh, very quickly, what are they? Uh, these, these are mostly open market repurchases uh, that uh, uh, the executives say, we want to go buy back our stock on the market. Uh, there's a difference, which uh, is important to understand, between companies announcing a program that are going to buy back so much stock over a certain period of time and then actually doing the buybacks, which is the actual manipulation of the market, because we don't know when they do it. The Security and Exchange Commission, the reg so-called regulatory agency, doesn't know when they're doing it. Uh, there are some people that know, the top executives know. Uh, I think the hedge funds can figure it out, and wherever you see buybacks, there's some hedge funds there uh, egging them on, sometimes with people on the board. Uh, but that's the way it works, and uh, it's allowed by the SEC. Uh, in fact, in, in November of 1982, uh, this rule, 10B18, uh, uh, which is probably the most damaging uh, let's say regulatory rule or deregulatory rule that was ever passed in the United States that no one ever heard of until uh, I think I brought it to light and through this research uh, basically says that companies can legally manipulate the market. So they can do uh, uh, up to 25% of their average tr daily trading volume for the last four weeks for ExxonMobil, which is the top of the list, that would be to about 250 million a day. And it can do them day after day after day. Uh, Apple it can do 1.5 billion a day and nobody knows when they're doing them uh, and uh, if they go over that amount this notion of a safe harbor is there's no presumption that they're necessarily manipulating the market now this turned out when we looked at the history of this to be uh, uh, what some people uh, end up calling a, uh, 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 a regulatory about face I'll come to that in a minute uh, and what I do in the Harvard uh, Business Review article, uh, before I come to the, the SEC, you know, how it changed, uh, is I go through the, some of the reasons that are given for buybacks, and they just don't hold water. Uh, so one is that uh, the stock is undervalued. Uh, this is a great investment. We believe in the company. But all the data show that companies are buying stock at high prices. Also, if, 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 if a company does that and is making that argument, the minute it tries to cash in for the company, it's going to be telling the market we think our stock is overvalued, so no one's ever going to do that. It's, it's an argument that's made by all the financial economists, but it's a totally phony argument. It's in the financial statements of many companies that they're doing this to offset 
uh, buy back, uh, uh, exercise the stock options. So if you have a company like Cisco, very broad-based stock option systems, a lot of stock options exercise. Even if for a company like that, the buybacks are multiples of what is being exercised as stock options. And anyway, it's a phony argument. Because if you're going to give people stock and you say, okay, work harder and smarter for the company, let's get our stock price up, we'll just wait till you have successful products. And you'll have more profits, your stock price should rise because of innovation, not because of manipulation. And people should be able to sell their stock at higher prices. You don't have to manipulate it with, with, with stock buybacks. It's a phony argument. The third argument, which is made more by economists, because most self-respecting uh, uh, CEOs would make this, although I sometimes wonder how many CEOs now in the United States are self-respecting. But in any case, uh, is that we're a mature company and there's nothing to invest in. Well, that is total nonsense. I mean, if you're running a major US company, uh, there's plenty of things to invest in, and there's plenty of ways in which you can share the gains which go beyond the company that, that, that if you understood where you know, the government spending supported you, uh, uh, how the company got to where it was, you, you, you would be allocating resources differently. It's justified on the basis that you should maximize shareholder value. Now that ideology is, is a totally flawed ideology. It comes from the theory, it's directly from the theory of the market economy. It's basically, as everybody gets a market uh, return except one group of people, common shareholders who have no guarantee of the return. And so if there's a loss, they'll bear the loss. If there's a profit, they'll get the profit. Uh, well, uh, in fact, anybody who goes to work for a company and is doing anything significant is taking a risk that in the future they won't get the returns that they're helping to create. Uh, and companies don't want to just hire good companies, people who are just pay, paying for doing the work today. They want people who are involved in this collective and cumulative learning process and are going to show up tomorrow. Uh, and so when, in fact, companies add this retain and reinvest system, the thing that Edith Penrose uh, 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 talked about, well, in fact, they were delivering uh, on, that, on that kind of promise and it was part of the success of the company. When they stopped doing it, with the ideology of shareholder value, that only the shareholders take risk, then, in fact, people who created value see their, the value they created uh, disappear. Taxpayers are constantly uh, making investments that firms are, 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 taking, uh, are using. Now, if there's a tax regime that recognizes this and there's a reasonable tax rate and the firms actually generate revenue, so we're taking a risk that we might make huge investments in the biotech industry, but it might not be successful, okay, we should get the return as taxpayers. But of course, the ideology of shareholder value has been part and parcel of saying there's only this group of people who create value. You have to cut tax rates in order to support this. You could see this particularly in the Bush tax uh, cuts in 2003, but it goes way beyond that. And people who create value do not get it. And in fact, the, the, the common shareholders, uh, they play virtually no role in general in funding these companies. They buy and sell shares that are uh, existing on the market. Money does not go into companies uh, because of this. And uh, we have uh, a lot of case studies which go into this uh, uh, process, uh, which, uh, 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 which, I, which I'll kind of indicate in a, in a few minutes. But basically, uh, a, a while no one actually, I was right here that uh, a few years ago, Mike was there, uh, I gave a talk on, uh, it was, a, it was a, 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 a conference on Apple's business model. <laughs> And I gave a talk about that, and I wrote an article about this, and then I wrote something after my Harvard Business Review article last September on their blog about when Carl Icahn, it was kind of, uh, I thought it was kind of nice, because Carl Icahn, who was one of the biggest predators in the United States, been around a long time, uh, took a $5 billion stake in Apple, and is now trying to drive that up to $10 billion uh, by doubling Apple's stock price, which is already at record levels last September. And, uh, and it's all based on just pumping all that money out of Apple uh, for his sake and, and the sake of other people who have these large, large stakes. And then he'll use that extra $5 billion to add to what he else he has to go after some other company. Okay, uh, the only time Apple ever raised money from the public stock market was in 1980 with $97 million in its IPO. And so there's no other contribution that shareholders, uh, have, public shareholders have made to that company since that time. Okay, uh, here looking at the institutions, why is the regulatory agency 
uh, allowing this to go on. And as I'll just talk about this for a few minutes and then and, and, and end, because this is now where I think there's some little impact coming from this research. Uh, it's kind of unfolding uh, right now. Uh, the SEC on its website says that it protects investors, maintains market integrity, and facilitates capital formation. This Rule 10b-18 certainly does not facilitate capital formation. Uh, it also, once you get into how buybacks are done and timed, uh, and the fact that only some people know about it, certainly doesn't protect, uh, maintain market integrity. And a lot of investors, including pension funds, and I've been convincing some of them that they should be dead set against stock buybacks if, if they can't uh, get in there and manipulate the markets along with the, the hedge funds, even though, you know, I'm not saying they should, but they, but they, they now, this uh, was a change in the SEC rules that came about uh, after the election of, of Ronald Reagan. And this guy here was the previous head of the Security and Exchange Commission. This is the last uh, uh, um, address he gave. Uh, his name is Harold Williams. He was a, a businessman at uh, dean of the U uh, University of Southern California Business School. Uh, and uh, he basically, this was all about a stakeholder argument about the corporation. And at that time, he wasn't talking about shareholder value, he wasn't talking about buyback. He was saying, as many people were, dividends might be too high uh, to get proper reinvestment, adequate reinvestment in the U.S. economy. Uh, he, he resigned a year and a half before his term ended because Reagan got elected and on a deregulation platform. And this guy, John Shad, came in. Uh, he was the first Wall Street guy to be head of the SEC since Joseph Kennedy was when it was first founded for six months. He was, you know, the father of JFK, Robert Kennedy, etc., who was a big stock market manipulator and they put, put a big supporter of Roosevelt and they put him in charge and then lawyers took over. Okay, so they put Chad in there. Chad really believed the more money that came into financial markets, uh, the more capital formation somehow you had. And he, he actually, one of the other things he pushed right from the beginning was derivatives. Um, and uh, uh, one of the first things he did uh, when he uh, became the head of the SEC uh, was he created a position for chief economist. And he put this guy, Charles Cox, there, who was a Chicago-trained PhD who was doing work on derivatives. Uh, and uh, you know where derivatives left, uh, led us. Um, and uh, then there was a guy who was actually a, a, a Nixon appointee named John Evans, uh, who was uh, against this new rule and said it might be manipulating the market from the information we have. And he was, and and then uh, Shad got rid of him, uh, put Cox in his place as a commissioner, and put an even more rabid Chicago economist in uh, this chief economist post. Um, when Shad uh, retired. There was a lot of insider trading going on, the Boski thing, milk and stuff was going on. And uh, he actually wasn't all that wealthy. This might have been the sum total of his wealth, but he gave it to Harvard Business School to teach about business ethics because his notion, I, I assume he was being sincere about this, was that you know, all this insider trading, this was kind of rooting the notion of that the market was fair. Well, in fact, he had helped make it unfair uh, through these rules, but you know, Harvard Business School at the time couldn't figure out uh, how to use this money, so they built this posh uh, f uh, fitness center, uh, which uh, was uh, part of the process of competing for executives uh, to learn about maximizing shareholder value. And uh, I, I must say that it does not say in shareholder value we trust at the top. I put that up there, but it, it might as well. Okay. Uh, people have been talking about excessive executive pay for some time since the early 90s. It remains highly e excessive, uh, even more than if you look at the AFL-CIO, the union's uh, executive pay watch uh, 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 um, website where they look at executive pay, the average worker actually, their estimates are way too low, uh, uh, mainly because they don't look at realized gains, which is what they should look at. Uh, the, pay, the average pay of top executives, which I just showed you, uh, 2013, uh, 500 highest paid executives about $32 million, 84% of that in the, this previous graph uh, uh, table was from stock-based pay. The hedge fund looked at, make them look like they're, they're just getting chump change here. Uh, and this is uh, recently from the Financial Times that uh, the top 
25 hedge fund managers, their, their total was down. They only averaged 11.6 billion uh, in uh, 2014, uh, down from about 25 billion, almost, or almost 900 million, uh, not, slightly less than that, but uh, the year before. So here you can, you can see these. These people, we don't know how much they're making from buybacks, but they're all over buybacks. Okay, so we, uh, uh, this is the Piketty data, which is, reflects some of this stuff. This is, uh, I have some stuff on what's happened to middle class jobs that I won't have time to get into, uh, but this is really where the expense is of or the cost of buybacks is that they're not retaining people, they're not passing on higher wages to people, people are not being engaged in collective uh, cumulative learning process. Uh, even when you have the state uh, making huge expenditures now, and this is the National Institutes of Health, $30 billion a year, uh, studies we've done on, of the industry, this is actually exacerbated financialization uh, because scientists at uh, universities who have stakes in companies are getting these grants uh, they're actually doing a lot of stuff with the NIH money that should be done by the companies, like clinical trials. And uh, there's all kinds of biotech companies, and a lot of them are near where I live in, in, in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, where people are making lots and lots of money without a product ever being produced, and the taxpayer is putting out $30 billion a year uh, to, uh, to, to allow this industry to exist. Um, the, I have a number of case st stuff, uh, which I can't, don't have time to go through about the cost of buyback stuff about international competition. IBM is one of the worst companies in terms of this. HP is another one. Uh, Microsoft is another one. There's a story I could tell about all these companies. Apple, uh, 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 when, uh, uh, last, last, when Carl Icahn uh, demanded that Apple do it, it turned out he wanted to do another 100 billion buybacks after doing 50 billion. Uh, the editors of Harvard Business Review got in touch with me, and they said we need you to respond to Carl Icahn. So that, so I wrote on their blog. Uh, I've written a number of things on the Harvard Business Review blog uh, that uh, they love because it's promoting the article. And uh, and uh, but uh, I said uh, Carl Icahn had written this as an open letter to Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, uh, to do these buybacks. And I said, well, I'll do it if uh, you give me two articles that I can write, one responding to the icon and one a uh, open letter to Tim Cook. Uh, so I, I won't go into it, it's in these slides and it's on, online, but basically the first one I critiqued uh, icon and the fact that what, what did he have to do with the company, uh, what I said before, and in the open letter to Tim Cook I go through all the ways in which a company like Apple, which could not possibly use all the money it has to reinvest in the company, could be using its, its money and at least providing some leadership. Uh, in, the, in the U.S. economy, and in the case of Tim Cook, who's actually given away uh, his whole fortune already, uh, you know, why is he doing this? Um, and uh, it's kind of, I don't know, it's a joke really, but uh, uh, a week, uh, I was talking to a reporter uh, uh, just after I wrote these things and called me up about it, and a, a week after I put up this open letter and I hadn't heard from Tim Cook, uh, uh, he announced, uh, was the first CEO announced that he was openly gay, you know. Uh, so I said, well, I th he could have done that last year, he could have done it next year, but I think he just wanted to distract attention from having to respond to my open letter. Anyway, uh, I have not heard from Tim Cook, and uh, I don't expect to, but uh, uh, I think he should hear what I have to say. Uh, there are other cases, uh, I was talking about this this afternoon, uh, GM, uh, an interesting case we got involved in uh, through with uh, a union, it was the first union, the Service Employees International Union that has gotten interest in buybacks where the top leadership has come out against buybacks. This just happened uh, about two months ago. Uh, so we did uh, uh, a study of McDonald's uh, where we show that uh, what's happened uh, with McDonald's, about three billion a year in buybacks. The real people paying the price in the first instance are the franchisees. Uh, and so the franchisees who are kind of Tea Party type people, I think, and but small business people with you know, a uh, million dollars invested in, you know, the, the, the McDonald's outlet, they are getting totally screwed uh, by this. And then they're putting pressure on the workers who are fighting for a minimum wage and they, and uh, actually what the SEIU is doing, they're doing a lot of stuff supporting the franchisees. And they see the buybacks issue as an issue that can unite the franchisees and the workers together. Uh, whether that will happen is another question. In the context of that, uh, this was, this was uh, for, this is a, a controller of New York City, uh, the controller of New York State, 
uh, the treasurer of Chicago and the controller of the state of California, representing about 840 billion in pension fund assets, uh, wrote this letter as the first time against buybacks. It was in the context of uh, protests at, 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 at McDonald's. And they actually, in some of the newspaper articles, they actually quoted workers as saying, no more buybacks, <laughs> you know, which is totally unprecedented. Uh, uh, Brookings published a paper on this. Uh, and um, uh, there is a, a senator uh, uh, in Wisconsin who has actually gone for the first time after consulting with us about buybacks and, and, and helping them shape the letter after the SEC about what you're doing uh, with, with these things. Uh, this uh, uh, has also been done, uh, raised by Elizabeth Warren, who is another very well-known senator uh, from Massachusetts in the United States, have been, has started talking about stock buybacks. For the first time, a commissioner, there's only five of them, on the SEC has come out against buybacks. I was told uh, that this was something that she really didn't know about much about six months before. And then uh, they, they got the picture. Uh, I have to say it actually, it's no doubt that, because it's documented in a lot of different, even in, in some of the things they say and in, in, in the footnotes, et cetera, that this is coming from my research. So this is kind of gratifying to have the stuff you've been doing for 30 years, I didn't get bored out of my mind, or at least I kept from getting bored out of my mind, that have, have this impact. Uh, there's a guy running for president who's shaking up the Democratic uh, uh, you know, process, you know, uh, party uh, uh, nomination process, Bernie Sanders from Vermont, who uh, has now come out against stock buybacks, and I'm trying to uh, educate his campaign a little about this. Uh, so this is from a uh, Le Monde, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the gauchistu is shaking up the democratic process. And uh, Elizabeth Warren had come out with these statements recently about stock buybacks, these are, and uh, has also uh, uh, made other statements based on my research. And here I, I, I would end this talk with, with this uh, two minute clip from Richard Trumka, who's the head of the AFL-CIO. And I've been talking to people at the AFL-CIO uh, since uh, the late 90s saying you should be dead set against this stuff. Uh, I, we don't have sound here, but basically the reason I put how do you spell that name at the top is that uh, he, he had been talking to a breakfast meeting of the Christian Science Monitor uh, uh, for about an hour about labor issues. And then right at the end, he said, I wanna, can I just drop one more thing in your lap? And they said, okay, go ahead. And he starts talking about this guy, Lazenick at UMass Lowell, who's doing this stuff on buybacks and, and how, and he's, you know, if we ask for a $2 raise, you know, we're being greedy, et cetera. And, and, and so he, you know, he, he kind of recited this stuff in the article. And then right at the end, uh, after about two minutes talking about the article, quite, you know, capturing what uh, a lot of the stuff I'd said about, particularly about CEO pay, uh, you hear a voice say, how do you spell that name? And he says, L-A-Z-O-N-I-C-K. And then there's a pause, and he says, it's in the Harvard Business Review. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, it's been a tour de force, <laughs> starting with economic theory up to uh, this recent development. I just have to announce that we are recording uh, this because it's illegal otherwise to start a debate without that. Uh, we are here now to collect questions. Lots of the people who are in the room were also in our workshop, so we've been discussing these things all day. Um, but I'm sure there is going to be still uh, lots of questions. Preet, Masud. Yeah, I just want to go back to your, uh, the graph you had about uh, wage productivity. You know, you have this long secular trend uh, of a period that wage and productivity moved together, and from the 1980s they diverged. I mean, one interpretation of this could be, and this is my like, materialist reading of what happened, that because of technological reasons, because of globalization and loss of labor, power, etc., wage productivity was based diverged, then these companies get a lot of excess. Capital, they don't know what to do with it, then these ideas come share whatever I need. Yeah. And that's one way of looking at it in terms of causality. The other way that you are uh, saying is that it is really the ideology of buyback which led to that divergence. Well, yeah, no, uh, let me get, yeah. Term is that no, I skipped over some stuff, and so there's a more, let's say, uh, sophisticated argument here. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what, what are the mechanisms? Yeah, so let me go to here. So that basically, 
uh, stuff that I had to skip over in the time is that there are real changes going on in the economy, and the thing is businesses do need to respond to these changes. So I, I call them rationalization, marketization, and globalization. Basically, uh, you started to have in the early 80s layoffs of blue-collar workers, and the first time companies would close plants permanently, not plan on hiring the workers back, and by the way, it really hit the African-American population more than anybody else at that time, because they were the last hired, first fired. And uh, this was because of Japanese competition. So this wasn't necessarily because of shareholder value ideology. But then rather than respond and say, we have to figure out how to upgrade the educa education and training of the labor force, we have responsibility uh, to keep people employed and to actually compete against the, the Japanese, which, are, for example, in the car industry, even though they still exist there, they never really have done, uh, they became financialized. And uh, I could give the example which I gave this, this afternoon, uh, that you heard about General Motors, how that happened from about the mid-1980s. Uh, so so by basically, then, often, plant closings throughout the 80s and beyond just were done just to get rid of heavy assets and get their stock price up, and, and, but without any notion that people have contributed to the success of the company and there was anyone else in it. Uh, the marketization, this is IBM took the lead in this in, uh, in the early 90s after having a, a policy without any unions of uh, never firing anybody involuntarily. So in 1990 they went, uh, they had 374,000 employees, uh, 1994, 220,000. Uh, they purposely got rid of lifetime employment they took huge losses, which were the cost of, of severance pay. Uh, they brought in Louis Gerstner, who then wrote a book, When Elephants Learned to Dance, which was all about just getting rid of lifetime employment. Now, there was a rationale, productive rationale. They had moved from a proprietary technology system to open systems with the PC revolution. And so they didn't need experienced workers as much anymore. And there's a whole decline of precipitous decline of research labs at this time. But uh, rather than recognize that the world had changed, but you still needed to have these companies uh, or some, co some consortium of these companies or in collaboration with the government uh, and through taxation going from these companies to the government, investing in uh, you know, capabilities that, uh, that could fund the next round of innovation, which they themselves had uh, benefited from, uh, they stopped doing that or they, as I put our, uh, one of the things I argue in the Harvard Business Review article, they start lobbying the government to do this stuff, even as they're just doing billions and billions of buybacks. Uh, so they don't see themselves as, as having any responsibility to fund some of that public research from their, their profits. Uh, and then globalization, uh, well, uh, there's nothing wrong with globalization because uh, it's the, we need the rest of the world developed. Uh, but what's happened with globalization, and in fact, it, it's reinforced by certain tax concessions that were made way back in 1960 that they now these companies take as, 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 as a right. Uh, they don't pay taxes on their global profits and, uh, until they repatriate them, so they don't repatriate them. They borrow money. Companies like Apple are borrowing money to do buybacks while they're keeping the profits abroad. Uh, and and uh, a company like Intel, uh, two weeks ago, uh, they announced they're going to lay off 5,000 people to have a billion dollars a year in savings in the, in the United States, uh, particularly uh, in, in Oregon where they have their microprocessor uh, uh, center. This is the, big, actually the biggest area for employment in, uh, of, of Intel in the world. Uh, and then they're doing $5 billion a year in buybacks. So uh, it's kind of, they just have gone, although you could say it originally you know, yeah, there's no, if you have better qualified people or equally qualified people at lower wages uh, in China or India, uh, why not invest there? But then take the profits from that and put it back into the place, the economy that supported your growth. And, of course, the ideology is, well, that has nothing to do with us. I mean, we, we, we are running this company for profits of shareholder value, etc. You know, we, we don't have, you know, where, where we came from has nothing to do with the success of our company. It was just a close, you know, just total garbage, but it's totally believed. So that's the problem, uh, that there have been these real structural changes in employment uh, that have changed the, you know, so I wouldn't advocate going back to this system of 
a career with one company. And also it was for actually a select group of people who then were in the majority white males. Uh, but, uh, but you do need to worry about what I call collective and cumulative careers. And so that's, that's really the cost of this. And I think it actually you need to take a lot of the technology that's coming out as part of the open letter to Tim Cook that's coming out of a company like Apple and looking for ways of using that for, to meet social needs. And if you look at history, including using that uh, you know, corporate uh, capabilities for military purposes, but also things like the Orphan Drug Act and, and pharmaceuticals, you do things that originally are not profitable and are done for social needs, or the government makes it profitable through, through subsidies, at some point you're going to have in your possession technologies that are going to open up whole new doors for profitable business opportunities. And so I argue that in not doing that, a company like Apple is actually deviating from an innovative business model. So yeah, so it's, 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 it's a lot more kind of sophisticated argument about what's changed in the world and how companies have to adapt to change. And, and it's no longer the American century and under any circumstance. Let's collect two, three questions. Mustafa? Yeah. Okay, so Bill, uh, this is really interesting. Uh, but I have a question about the Chinese in a sense, what you're saying is that real value in organizations is added by the workers and the government. And yeah. I agree with you. Right? Right. But if that's the case, then isn't there something fundamentally wrong with the property rights structure of modern capitalism, which is completely different? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. So in a sense, just getting share buybacks isn't enough. You have to go back to Marx. In a sense, capitalism might have outlived its purpose in some sense. That the, Property rights structure, which gives you that long-lasting patient capital, is missing. Yeah. And so, but that contradicts with your 2000s globalization story, because if the working class is globalized, then who are the owners of this technology? Yeah. Well. So, and in a sense, what yeah. I would like to push you towards. No, but I think this relates to the kind of work you were talking about, because, you know, nevertheless, okay, you have a global comp company, so it's going to deal with uh, governments in a lot of different places. Maybe we need global governance too, but nevertheless, uh, okay, they're, they're, they, they are, are uh, global, but yet they, they do lobby for special privileges in the United States. They lobby for government funding uh, for the technologies they need. So if they're going to do that, then say, okay, then you know, let's, what are we getting back for this? And how are you going to be governed for that? I mean, one of the things I put in the Harvard Business Review article, which, which they never questioned, was that since it's workers and taxpayers who are creating value or putting money at risk that is creating value or effort at risk in the case of workers, uh, then they should be on boards. Uh, and actually in the Brookings uh, paper, uh, I quote Robert S. Brookings, uh, uh, who in a, in a book called uh, Industrial Democracy, uh, America's Answer to Socialism and Communism, written in 1929, uh, said that uh, money, uh, capital, is just a commodity. You should get a market return, and labor creates value and should have liberal representation on, on the boards of companies. Well, that does not exist in the United States. Of course, it does exist in Germany, uh, and I think the Germany's benefit. Uh, so, so there are different governance processes. It still needs to be done uh, at this stage and, you know, at a national level. Uh, things like this Security Exchange Commission the rules, they can be changed. Uh, and actually, if you can push that debate further and say, what, what is the Security and Exchange doing, Security Exchange Commission doing that's contradicting its own mission, you open up that debate. Uh, but no, I would certainly push it that further. Now, I would say there is a difference uh, between dividends and, and buybacks. Okay, uh, once you recognize that there's a lot of savings in the economy, we have pension funds, we have lots of savings, we want to get a return. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with saying, okay, there's shares on the market. Uh, you can put your money into those shares. Maybe they'll rise in price, but you don't want to do it through manipulation, you know, through innovation. Maybe there's some speculation going on and, and some people, you know, that, that isn't the big problem here. Uh, but those dividends have to be reasonable. And so what's happened, as I said, that was the debate in the 70s. Uh, even Fisher Black, you know, Black Scholes, he wrote a, an article, The Dividend Puzzle, and why are companies even paying dividends? And he couldn't resolve this, but he recognized that there was 
some, something gained by reinvesting money. You know, he didn't have a theory of this, of innovative enterprise, but okay, so, but at the same time, uh, what, uh, and I've been talking to institutional investors about this, okay, if you have all the savings of, let's say, workers, and you want to get a return, well, uh, yeah, if there's these public companies, uh, and they can pay some dividends, uh, that's one way you can get a return. Uh, it, it's riskier than putting it into treasury bills or other things, but it, it's one way you get a return. But you want that return to be there over the long term, and it actually, at the point where, which you're not timing, where you have to sell some of the shares, uh, you would like the whole stock market to be up. You should be absolutely against buybacks, because they're not going to benefit, someone's taking money out now, and you're not timing the market, you're not, that's not the business you're in. So I draw a big distinction between that form of, of payment to, 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 to uh, shareholders and buyback. It's not a property right. Uh, uh, originally, in, in, in the early 20th century, when you had the separation of ownership control, to get people to hold shares, they had preferred shares uh, that gave you a legal right to, to profits if they're ever made. Uh, that then, once the, uh, the, the stock market it was really only when you had the rise of big business, the consolidation of big business in the 1920s that you had a widespread distribution of, of shareholding and uh, companies said, okay, uh, we can uh, uh, issue common shares and people will buy them on the market in the hope that they'll go up in price and if they want an income, we'll pay them some dividends. At that point, shares did not necessarily have voting rights. Uh, it was only, uh, it was a guy from Harvard named Ripley who wrote a book on Main Street and Wall Street who kind of believed that the shareholders were still somehow should have a responsibility for running these companies, recognized the separation of ownership control. He started raising this thing, oh, why don't they have voting rights? The New York Stock Exchange said, said okay, any listed stock now has to have voting rights. Uh, but at that time, they knew that shareholding was so widely distributed that voting rights didn't really matter. Uh, and so, and, and it, it didn't matter until you actually, even with the institutional investor, until you got the hedge funds there, who, who now actually can get, you know, 3% of the shares, demand a seat on the board, somehow this is enough of an interest for, for, for them to, you know, accede to this. And, you know, there is this notion of, of rights, but at that, yeah, there are, there are no rights. Uh, there are just, you're a portfolio investor, the money is a commodity, you have limited liability, uh, you have a highly liquid market, so it's a very low, low cost. Unlike a worker, you can put your money in and take it out. Uh, but I wouldn't argue against dividends because uh, we have savings, and, we're, and why not get some of the money out of companies that can go to the general public as, as a return on their savings, if it's, if it's reasonable. Um, you know, so that's that kind of, but buybacks are a totally different uh, phenomenon. Um, Is there any other question? Okay, I think we are all pretty tired that we deserve mm. a glass of wine. I think we need a glass of wine. <laughs> so yeah. thanks a lot. Okay, thanks. Again, thanks a lot. Thanks for your life. <laughs> Just a small announcement. We are going to have uh, other lectures during the next academic year, and in particular, uh, we're going to have uh, Professor Andy Sterling from Sussex. Uh, in, uh, in the first term, and uh, then uh, Professor Rafa Kaplinski, again at SPRU, and Christos Pidelitz from University of Bath. And we're going to have other activities connected to this uh, cluster, so I invite you to follow some of these activities on, uh, on our uh, web page. Uh, all these activities will be video recorded, so it's possible to uh, follow them. Thanks again. Bye. Yeah. Wow, was it too okay. <laughs>